Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to just wait another minute or so as people keep trickling in. Okay, let's get started. So today we're going to continue our conversation oops, of microfinance. Um, and I'll, I'll just give a quick recap of where we landed last time. Um, we first talked about you know, what microfinance is, what are all of the contract characteristics that conceivably could make it uh, work so well at achieving scale and profitability. And then we talked about the first wave of impact evaluations, which actually ended up being quite a disappointment to the practitioner community. Um, while the narrative that microfinance is, is stimulating uh, transformative business growth and women's empowerment was one that was quite strong, it turns out on average that narrative doesn't come out nearly as strongly as one would have hoped uh, from the practitioner perspective. Um, in, the, in the seven RCT studies we discussed. However, what, we've all, what we also learned is that borrowers aren't monolithic, they have heterogeneous goals and the impacts of microfinance on perhaps unsurprisingly look quite different depending on the group. And so what we saw is that credit you know, can be used as a way to finance entrepreneurship. For those people who already had a business when microfinance entered, microfinance did indeed, at least in one of the studies where we have longer run follow-up data, have quite uh, persistent impacts on profits, wage bills, people are hiring more, they're working more, they're, they're, they have more businesses, et cetera. However, only about half of the people in the, the, the Spandana India study that we discussed in detail even ever start a business. And so clearly they're using microfinance as a way to consume sooner. Now, the jumping off point for a lecture today is that microfinance typically doesn't attempt to distinguish between these groups at all. Uh, screening technologies can be expensive. We'll get into this a lot more in just a minute. Uh, and the homogenous contracts that microfinance offers, meaning when a loan officer comes into a village, oftentimes everybody in that village gets the same contract, that really does allow the microfinance institution to economize on costs, and that's part of what makes the model profitable. And then finally, a third element is that we haven't discussed yet that we're going to get into a lot more today is that these contracts um, limit risk-taking in, in that they start demanding repayment right away, the first week or the first month. That might improve repayment, but that might also hold back the returns of the business. So it could be that there are lots of heterogeneous motives for borrowing. Different types of borrowers might you know, need in an ideal world uh, different types of products. And microfinance is something that's actually sustainable and scalable, but it's not quite the right product for any one group. So what we're going to talk about today is how microfinance might be tweaked to lead to stronger impacts. And of course, we'll have to think about what this means for the, the scalability and the profitability as well. I think something right away to, to, to ask is what types of products might be better for these gung-ho entrepreneurs, the people who have a solid business idea, they have a des desire to expand that business, but the credit constraints because of their limited wealth are really holding them back. So we called these gung-ho entrepreneurs last time. 
in contrast, you might have non-entrepreneurs who just want to borrow to you know, create lumps, of, uh, lumpy consumption, so, so to, to buy durables, for example. Or we might have people who are reluctant entrepreneurs, they really don't necessarily want to be in business, but when credit constraints are, are when credit, when interest rates relax, when credit supply expands, they might think, well, the labor market doesn't work particularly well. I'm going to start a low productivity business just to get by. So one possibility that we might want to head towards are larger individual loans for the first group, for those gung-ho entrepreneurs, making sure they're really getting enough capital to make those fixed capital investments, get their business to a larger scale and perhaps even improve savings technologies for the second group, for those non-entrepreneurs who really just wanna transform small amounts of income into, into lumpy consumption. And it, it, it might be the case that given the profit motive and the profitability of MFIs, they actually don't have very strong incentives to segment these markets. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about today uh, is first how to improve microfinance and improve it by that, I mean, um, find a product that might lead to larger impacts across the board. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is how to improve screening. Given that we found this group of entrepreneurs that do seem to have larger, uh, more persistent impacts on profits, on asset stocks, on revenues, and all of the things that um, the, the original seven studies looked for across the board, can we figure out a way to, to, to identify them? And then second, are there innovations and in product offerings and on contract design that might also unlock some of these larger impacts uh, within the context of microfinance? And there's been some experimentation that has some, you know, early positive uh, indications that 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 you know there could be some 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 straightforward tweaks to make. After talking about that, we're going to move on to a separate topic which is thinking about the aggregate impacts of microfinance. And we're gonna do this in two different ways. First, at, at the you know, district level in India, where uh, what happens when microfinance is withdrawn? Are there impacts on wages on, on total consumption? And do the impacts in aggregate look different from the impacts in partial equilibrium that we saw last time in the, uh, in the seven RCT studies? And then finally, we're gonna talk about the interplay between formal finance with microfinance centers and the informal risk sharing and credit market that's going on in the background that's related to the, the topic that Chris Udry uh, presented earlier in this module. Okay, so let's start with screening. And again, I'll, uh, please put your questions in the q and I'll try to get to them as they come. And then I also have some question breaks just like last time. Uh, set up in my slides uh, in case you know you have questions that come up a bit later. Okay, so the first question we want to talk about is it better to offer, is it possible to offer better contracts to these gung-ho entrepreneurs? Now again, this is going to make many of the contractual advantages that we outlined last time and, and just a few slides ago of microfinance in terms of profitability disappear. But there might be some hope. So first, Screening on business age doesn't really seem too hard. Remember in that longer run study, all we did was ask, did this household actually have a business before microfinance entered? That's not deep, deep information that would require a tremendous amount of due diligence. Um, that's something that's pretty straightforward to potentially screen on. However, um, even more than that, we think that one can do better with, with, with various strategies. And I'll talk about two such strategies in just a minute. And then separately, microfinance institutions have increasingly been moving toward an individual loan model and also to a graduation model. And a graduation model, just to preview what that means, is that if you take people in that standard joint liability group uh, paradigm that we talked about so much last time, you see who's still willing to borrow, who still has demand for credit, also who's been a good repayer, and you give them a larger individual liability loan after they've had a chance to prove themselves. So this is another tool that microfinance institutions do use and could potentially use even more. So screening. So as I said before, the standard microfinance contract is really not designed to accommodate much screening. Some of this is outsourced to the group, but we talked about that last time that we don't have very strong evidence that the group is doing much screening. Um, the loan officers are giving homogenous contracts, so everybody's getting the same thing. There's near perfect repayment uh, by doing that, 
So then there's really no need to invest in screening. And this is true both for group screening and for the MFI level screening. And for, remember this model is pretty cost uh, intensive. Um, the loan officers are going into villages every single week or every single month, making their rounds, making their collections. So this is very, very labor intensive. And so the one of the main costs on the side of the MFI are the loan officers. Asking them to do more screening is going to raise the cost. And if they're asked to make some of these judgments themselves on the fly in the villages or collect data, that might mean they need a different type of worker with a higher level of education who would need a higher wage. So not only would they become less productive, you might also need to hire somebody who earns a higher daily wage, and this might throw the, 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 the profit calculation of the model off. So what could, what, what, and then all, on top of all of this, the types of borrowers who borrow from microfinance are exactly the types of people who don't have credit bureau records, uh, who have very limited information sources. So there are a few possibilities that we're going to talk about. Um, one is because of uh, you know the, the revolution of machine learning, big data, all of uh, cell phones, mobile payments, and the other is something that's much more traditional, uh, which is peer information. Okay. So this is related to I'm sure what Tabnit story is going to cover in one of the next sets of lectures. So I'm just gonna give just a, a little highlight of where, of where this is going. But I do think that the rise of mobile phones, the rise of digital payments, and then the accompanying rise of FinTech is going to be a game changer in this field. There was a question yesterday, where is microfinance going in Africa in particular? But I think this is gonna be true around the world. I think gonna, there's gonna be a lot more players who are able to, to reach lower wealth communities exactly because of these new digital sources of information and also sources of enforcement that are coming online. So I'll leave a lot of that discussion uh, to Tavneet, but I will just highlight this one paper uh, by Bjorkegren and Grissen. So what they point out is that even before we get to mobile payments, mobile phones alone are much more prevalent than bank accounts. And this is also um, a point that uh, not, uh, internationally representative surveys of over 100 countries also, also show the, the world really has adopted mobile phones quite quickly and, and quite thoroughly. So they go to a middle income country in South America. In this place, 34% of households, have, uh, or I think it's adults, have bank accounts, 89% in mobile phones. That's a really, really big gap. And what they do is they collect mobile phone usage data and also loan repayment information from a large telecom company in that country. Now, anytime you have access to administrative data like this, you can get thousands of fields. So they are able to get 5,500 attributes from the telecom and from the, from the metadata. And what they are able to do is say, huh, so we have this new data source. What if we put, and we have the past repayment history of people who were given loans. Can we use that telecom data to predict who was a good repayer and who wasn't? And that's exactly what you need to do if you want to build a screening model. And what they're able to show is that when they have a model where they add in these 5,500 mobile predictors, they can actually outperform a credit scoring model using credit bureau records alone. Moreover, which something that I think is quite uh, promising for this segment of the market without a credit bureau uh, history, they show that their model works just as well for those with no credit record at all. And what they say is that individuals in the highest quintile of risk by the measure used in their article, based on these 5,500 mobile attributes, they're 2.8 times more likely to default than those in the lowest quintile. And so this could be extremely valuable information to a lender, um, and that, can, that could all be processed algorithmically, for example. So let me show you what the attributes look like in particular. So they have some demographics like uh, age and gender, and they can they the, this column, the second column is the correlation of each of these factors with repayment. The third column is the T stat, and so just as a rule of thumb, T stats you know around two right are, are going to be something that's statistically significant, um, and the stronger the T stat, the more precise that that relationship. And so it does look like uh, older people repay more. There's not a very strong correlation with um, women. Uh, credit score, the, do they, if they have a credit bureau record, their summary score and the fraction of debt lost in the past 
Those are all correlated with repayment with reasonable T-stats. The summary score is quite predictive as you would hope and you would expect. But on top of that, they look at many of these phone usage um, characteristics, which might not be particularly you know, correlated with credit bureau and they might provide a lot of extra information and that's exactly what these authors show. Um, so they have something about periodicity, which is text messages by day, um, the slope, the slope of daily calls out, meaning how much does the, do, does the call volume grow across the day, both of these happen to be uh, correlated, the correlation in text messages two months ago versus today, so how stable is your usage across time, um, the variance, the difference between the 80th and 50th quantile of text messages used on days texts are used, and then uh, the, this, this other one, for example, is the number of important geographic location clusters. Now, this might be particularly useful. So this might tell you how dispersed your risk sharing network is, how many different locations are you making calls or text messages to. If you're a business, it might say something about where your customers are based. And all of these have T-stats well above two and provide predictive power and help make this work. So you could imagine um, you know, alternative credit scoring mechanisms coming on board and being something that could be quite valuable to any sort of lender, not just a, not just a micro lender. And it could also be that lenders that, that focus on these types of um, big data sources of information, they might be a new competitor to microfinance institutions. It might just be a separate set that we see emerge. And, and I think Tabney will get into this a little bit in her lecture. I think that's one very exciting place that uh, a lot of the credit to the previous and um, previously unbanked is, is going the, the fintech direction. Okay. So a second place um, this this could all go uh, is to, to really try to fine tune the peer screening that is in some sense embedded already into the uh, microfinance contract structure through just having groups. So Natalia Rigol Benroth and Reshma Hassam they investigate this. And what they want to know is whether individuals have knowledge about the returns to capital of their peers. So if we want to find the people to lend to where we'll see the highest impacts, you know, why are they asking about marginal returns? Well, those are exactly the people who might benefit the most from a slight relaxation in their liquidity constraints. And so if we can figure out who has the highest marginal returns, that's exactly the population we want to home in on. In their particular context, they run an experiment with micro entrepreneurs in Amravati, Maharashtra in India, and they conduct a baseline with about 1300 households. Now what they do, um, instead of working with a microfinance institution and the pre-existing groups, they are just you know, starting with all of the micro entrepreneurs they can find, and they're picking groups themselves of five people based on geography. So they're really trying to think about the five businesses that are on the same block, or right next to each other in the same market. And they wanna know, is there peer information among them? Do they know which of those five entrepreneurs has the highest or potential returns to capital? And then at the, bi the bigger question, which they're gonna to move toward answering, but I don't think they're gonna get all the way to answering, is, is this the kind of information that a microfinance institution or any other kind of lender could actually harness and use in their underwriting model? So to make progress on this, they invite these groups of five to come to a meeting and they give them all a chance of winning a hundred dollar grant. Now this looks a lot like the strategy of that canonical returns to capital paper, Demel, McKenzie and Woodruff. At the meeting, uh, what they do is they conduct a ranking activity. So for example, they ask among these five, who could grow their profits the most? if they were to receive this $100 or 6,000 rupee grant. Okay, so I think this is really the, you know, the, 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 the picture that says it all in their paper um, and it's just quite striking. So what they're plotting here are the marginal returns to the grant, the solid line are the grant losers and the dashed line are the grant winners. So on average, they're gonna find, if you take the average of all of the points in the dark line of the solid line and the average of all the points in the dashed line, indeed getting a grant increases your profits. So this is similar to the original Demel McKenzie Woodruff result. 
But what they have on top of that is they can look at the difference in between treatment and control depending on where in the rankings that lottery winner or lottery loser ended up among that group of five. So um, what, what the x-axis is doing is it's saying, where did this business rank among uh, all of the others in the group? If it's zero, that means everybody in the group ranked them as having the lowest returns to capital. If they're one, everybody in the group oops, ranked them as having the highest returns to capital. So if, for example, the lender could just go tap into that information for free, and we'll talk about why that's not possible in just a second, the lender could be able to build a credit score out of the variable on the x-axis. And what they show is that there are large returns to capital for the, for the businesses that had got high ranks, where their peers thought that they had high marginal returns. It turns out they did indeed have high marginal returns. Um, in this incentivized way, when you drop $100 onto those firms, their profits go up by the most. And for the bottom third of firms in that ranking exercise, their marginal returns are zero. So there's a lot of information to extract. So what does this mean? If you're the lender and you want to target impact, not necessarily just repayment, you really want to hit the top, let's say, 40% of firms by this ranking measure. And that could be a really powerful way to target credit. You could also just think, well, maybe we'll give the money to everybody if everybody's repaying, but we wanna make sure you have larger loans to these businesses that really have a good use case for it. So there are lots of different ways one could think about incorporating this information into uh, a, lending, a lending framework. Now, what's the problem? with this? Well, clearly, if you're asking people in a community who has the highest returns to capital, and then as a lender, you lend to the, to the, to the firms where the, the peers said, um, the peers you know, said that this is the one with the highest returns to capital, pretty soon it's not gonna be too hard for the people answering these survey questions to figure out the game, right? So as soon as they learn the lending algorithm, they might have big incentives to game it. They might wanna game it in their own favor. They might wanna game it in the favor of their cousins or their friends, or they might get kickbacks from their friends if they rank them highly. So you just really worry that this would start unraveling if the lender starts doing this strategy widely. Now here, when they were um, answering this, there were no incentives at all, right? The likelihood of getting the grant was completely independent of what people said about the potential profitability of the firm. So this is a very pure measure. The doing this in practice is going to be much less pure. And so what they do is they, they, they actually demonstrate this quite nicely. Um, rank is gonna be that zero to one variable I showed you on, on the x-axis before. Um, and then they uh, have, they, they vary the conditions under which people um, are doing the rankings. And so sometimes they actually turn on stakes where there's some benefit, uh, uh, where, where the, the, the highly ranked firms get some benefit versus not. When they turn on stakes, the predictive power of the, um, of the ranking uh, goes down. So let me just take a step back. What I'm showing you here, so they, they couldn't do that really nice capital drop experiment for everybody, at, for, for all of these different iterations, because that was gonna get very, very expensive and you would need a really large sample size. So what they did instead is they asked questions that about for each business about just some of their true outcomes, not their marginal returns, but income, profits, hours worked, et cetera. Um, and it turns out these things are correlated with marginal returns in the other experiment. Um, they, they make for then after that, they can do the peer ranks in, in several different ways uh, and they'll have more that they can just learn about the sample. So ideally you'd want their actual marginal returns, but that's not exactly what they have here. So what this shows is that if you have, uh, if you do the, if you, if you uh, ask what's the correlation between rank and the, that index of business attributes when there are no incentives, there's a strong positive correlation. However, when you add stakes to that ranking exercise, that strong positive correlation attenuates by about a third. So you lose about a third of the predictive power that you had before. 
Um, and again, the stakes is, is a treatment where the peer report is used to allocate some money. I think it's a smaller amount of money than the $100 from the main experiment. I'm not showing you this here, but the authors also do document that this problem is especially bad for family and close friends. So when they're family and close friends, the when, and, and you add stakes, it really takes away most of the predictive power of those rankings because the rankings become perverted um, and, uh, and tainted. Okay. So what they're, what they're gonna try to do is explore a few possible solutions. So um, one is to make these peer rankings in public, to do, to do this with some sort of public accountability. Perhaps it's the case that if you're gonna talk about how, how great these other firms are, um, you might feel a little ashamed if you take the worst firm and you rank them number one. So that might be something that puts you in check. And that would be something that'd be really easy to implement in practice in a group type scenario because you're already having group meetings. Then they also um, do an elicitation where peers receive incentives for correct reports. Now, again, you can only incentivize based on the information that you have, and so this becomes a little tricky, um, but this is another type of thing that you might want to check. Okay, so um, what, what are these columns? So again, the left-hand side variable is that index of, of contemporaneous business outcomes, where a higher value is a business with higher income, higher profits, more employees, et cetera. Um, in the odd columns, uh, there are no stakes. Uh, in the even columns, there are stakes. And remember, stakes is where we're really worried about the rankings backfiring. And then um, in the first two columns, they can include themselves in the rankings. And then um, in columns three and four, they're only talking about their peers and they can't talk about themselves. So I think it makes the most sense to, uh, to focus on columns three and four. So when there are no stakes, the rank uh, has, you know, it, is, it has predictive power. Um, doing the ranking in public actually increases that predictive power. Uh, incentives also help, but then adding it all together, um, there aren't complements, they're substitutes, the, the public versus incentives. When we think about the, the environment with stakes, again, the, the rank is less effective by itself than when there are no stakes. How, and, and I think what's really interesting is that doing it in public doesn't do anything anymore when there are stakes. So it does seem that public keeps people honest when there are low stakes. So maybe people remember or they, you know, they want to just look like the herd. Uh, but, but public accountability doesn't really matter at all in a context where there are, um, there are stakes. But incentives do matter. And incentives can more than double the value of that ranking if done correctly. Okay, so, um, so I think, you know, one big question that emerges from this is, you know, how, how would you actually implement these incentives in practice? I think a scalable technology would likely look quite different. Um, and it might have to look a little bit like the incentivized referrals in the Brian Carlin and Zinman paper we talked about before. So I think this is a super, super interesting proof of concept and they push the idea as far as they can. Um, but I think there needs to be a little bit more work to understand that final step. How do you, you know, we know that the peers have information. We know that they're gonna lie about that information if, if they have the incentives to do so. There are things one can do to try to get better quality information, but how to really harness that at scale I think there's still one step missing in that causal chain. However, I think this is super, super interesting. And especially this picture um, uh, of how much peers actually know, that's quite exciting and makes me think that more should be done to, to figure out how this, can, this type of thing can be used. Okay. So I think I have a question break. Yes, and there's also, so please put your questions in, in the Q&A. There's one right here from Saheed. Um, how does the model address variation in risk attitude between microfinance and entrepreneurs? Um, so I'm not quite sure exactly what you mean. Um, I guess the, is, the, is the question related to the fact that microfinance wants uh, the incentives for the bankers and for microfinance are for, for the entrepreneurs to take safe projects, but the entrepreneurs are gonna maximize potentially their profits. 
if they're doing something a little bit more risky. That's absolutely true. There's a, there is a big tension between those two. And I have actually a few papers to talk exactly to that point next. Um, so uh, it, after the next couple of papers, Sahid, if I still haven't answered your question, please, please pose it again. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, great. Oh, oh N in the result table. Yeah, so N usually just means the number of people. So these are um, the number of businesses in their sample for each of these columns. I don't know, oftentimes they bounce around um, maybe because somebody didn't answer one question, they're missing observations, uh, et cetera. Um, but um, the, oh, I see. So I guess sometimes it's the number of people, but then each person is answering like questions on behalf of others. So that's why you might have, let's say 1300 people answering the question, but maybe you know, more than 3000 because each person might be answering about three different people. I think that's probably what's going on here. Okay, so next, how can the, there be innovation on this product? So I'm gonna to get to the risk-taking and flexibility in just a second, but what I'm gonna first talk about is this graduation model that I, I discussed before. So again, as I said, microfinance generates information about borrowers over the loan cycle. The, if the loan officer is going into the village, he's interacting with these households, excuse me, um, there's information that just emerges about those households businesses. They see the repayment history on, on paper in their you know, um, MIS systems, and they understand something about the demand for credit for these different households. Some households might say, yeah, you know, I've had three cycles and I'm done. And others might say, no, I want four, I want five, I want six, et cetera. So one idea is to take successful borrowers and give them larger loans. And often in the graduation model, you give them individual liability loans and you can make these loans more customized because you know these are already your most profitable customers perhaps. So there's this paper by Bari et al in Pakistan where the authors investigate how to deliver more financing to successful microfinance clients. And they're working with a, um, a nonprofit MFI in Pakistan that's providing Sharia compliant financing. So they're interest-free loans. This is a little bit of a special type of lender. Um, and what, they're, what they do is they give larger loans after households have successfully repaid up to a cap of about $500. So that's already something they're doing. What they wanna do is make that even better and even better for entrepreneurs. So they have a new product idea, which is a higher purchase contract or something in the US which we call rent to own contracts. So the borrowing entrepreneur selects an asset for their business. So for example, they could pick a sewing machine or some other machine. It needs to be a fixed asset that they can install in their, in their business. The lender then approves a purchase of up to $2,000. This is four times the cap of the previous graduation model. So this is a way to get them into an individual liability loan, a way to get them into an actual fixed asset for their business, and also a way to deliver much larger amounts of financing to these entrepreneurs. So now this is gonna be structured as an equity contract instead of a debt contract, where the borrower posts 10% down payment, the microfinance institution buys 90%, and over 18 months, the borrower pays a rental fee for the use of asset, and over time, buys out the MFI's equity share. So they start out only owning 10% of the machine, and at the end, they own 100% of the machine. Now, in case of a breach of contract, because the MFI is the one that has helped install the asset, they've seen it with their own eyes, and they have a 90% claim to it, they're going to liquidate that asset and split the proceeds by ownership shares. So if at the time of default, the borrower had paid back 50% of the value, when the MFI liquidates and sells it, MFI keeps 50%, the borrower keeps 50%. Okay, so this is a very interesting kind of contract. It's an equity contract instead of a debt contract and it's really trying to get more meaningful capital uh, into, into these small firms, which could be quite valuable for exactly those gung-ho entrepreneurs we talked about last time. Now, there is one potential problem, which is that it might be very hard to liquidate this asset in low enforcement environments, so especially in a place like Pakistan or India. Um, the courts are just not very 
uh, helpful. For land disputes, it takes up to 10 years. Um, and so you'd imagine if it takes 10 years to repossess a sewing machine, that sewing machine isn't really gonna be worth much or the sewing machine could disappear over the course of those 10 years. So I think in this particular context, they're leaning quite heavily on screening and the type of customer that this nonprofit Sharia compliant lender uh, is, you know, is working with, especially those who have, who have you know, gotten to this point in the graduation program. So I think this is the one caveat on this kind of a product. Okay, so what do they do? They look at 757 borrowers who'd successfully repaid at least one loan and they've maxed out of their cap. Um, and then they have three treatments. So they have the control, which is the status quo. They can take that extra interest-free loan at the cap, the $500 loan. So it's not like the control group's getting nothing. The control group's just getting this much more modestly sized loan. Treatment A, they get the higher purchase contract with a fixed payment schedule. Treatment B, they get a higher, higher purchase contract with some flexibility built in. Uh, it turns out the treatment A and treatment B look similar. I'm also gonna talk about flexibility in detail just uh, as my next couple examples. So I'm just gonna show pooled results. Now, interestingly, we can already ask about demand for these loans. So for the first loan, the control loan, the status quo loan, 30% of people who are eligible are interested in actually taking it. But that goes up to 50% for these higher purchase contract loans. And it doesn't look like the flexibility is any more desirable um, to, to some of these entrepreneurs and others. Now, of course, there's gonna be flexibility built into even treatment A, because there's gonna be a pretty high bar for the MFI to be willing to go actually liquidate this asset. So maybe, Maybe the borrowers actually thought, well, I, I can probably negotiate a little bit of flexibility into this. Okay, so here are the two-year results. So assignment just means you are assigned to the one of these uh, higher purchase contracts instead of the status quo five hundred dollar uh, loan. Um, and what you see across the board are really strong impacts on all business outcomes. So they're more likely to still have a business. They have more businesses. Their businesses have more assets. This is about a 10%, uh, sorry, uh, it's big actually, sorry. So their control means a thousand, the treatment effect is 400. It's a 40% increase. Um, business revenues uh, actually are not statistically significantly higher, but business profits are about 10% higher um, and quite precisely estimated. So this again, looks like the effects on those gung-ho entrepreneurs. Um, and you know these are quite impressive, large results. Turns out in practice, um, I think they gave several hundred contracts through this uh, through this RCT. They only had default on the um, this equity rent to own contract in I think only a handful under ten cases. So people really did continue repaying at a very high rate, just like in the standard microfinance model. Um, when you think about where in the assets uh, are coming from, how they're building assets. It's almost all in fixed assets. So their fixed assets are more than 80% increased over what they had before. This is the specific asset they're buying with the rent owned product probably. And there's not much going on in terms of cash accounts receivable or inventories. And this, this might be as you expect, but being able to operate with that asset instead of without that asset is quite um, helpful for increasing uh, firm profits. So these are, are really exciting results that kind of match some of the previous intuitions. Household incomes go up, household consumption goes up. Again, this is something that's been hard to find in some of the previous studies. Um, nothing on savings, uh, household loans go down and household assets. So these would be like refrigerators, televisions, bicycles, these types of things, mobile phones, these actually go up modestly. Um, remember one of the big, uh, um, uh, elements that microfinance practitioners were pushing is that once you've made the business bigger, you've given the woman uh, entrepreneur uh, more respect, more say in the household, the household is going to invest in their children's education. Will you actually see that in this study? So when the, the loans are going to these well-selected businesses, these assets are, are making a big difference in household incomes. You also see the follow-up effect of, of an increase in expenditures in education. So some of that story is, is also coming through, although I'm not reporting those, those results here. Okay. Um, okay, so there is one specific question about this. 
Oh, so um, there's a question. Why mean control number of employees is less than one? Ah, yes. So typically when they ask about employees, they're asking about um, employees other than the owner. That's exactly right. Sometimes you also want to ask separately about employees that aren't part of your household. So are they actually hiring employees and paying a wage? That's a very good question. Um, I think, you know, a stylized fact about firms in developing countries is that a very, very large fraction are only using the labor of the owner, maybe the labor of other household members. Um, I think it's less than the majority are actually paying workers on their payroll outside of that. And I think if you look at the control means from the, set, the last paper we discussed last time, you'll see some similar, some similar uh, results there. Okay. So this is a, these are some exciting also proof of concept results. Um, okay, so there's, uh, there's one question from Jose. Could having very local bank employees try to get to know their clients over time approximate the information peers have? Um, absolutely. So, and this is the, the traditional banking model where you have your loan officer, the loan officer comes and does due diligence, they're in your community, you know them very well, and they're the ones who are going to, um, you know, be able to help you and work with you and understand, should we foreclose on your mortgage or should we give you a little bit of extra space to repay um, because of knowing the nature of those shocks. So that's relationship banking. And I think that's a powerful kind of, of banking that exists out there. I think it's a little tricky um, for a couple of reasons. So one is that it's pretty costly and labor intensive. And given that these households have very small loans um, and the profit per loan is small, it's gonna be hard to make a for-profit model work well on that. That's, that's not to say these, these types of lenders don't exist. You gave a nice example in Peru. Um, there's another example in uh, India called KGFS. And their whole model is wealth advisors to the poor. So they have branches inside the village. The loan officers or the program officers are, are meant to get to know the households, get to know their needs. And then those loan officers aren't compensated on the profits they bring into the firm. They're compensated off of you know, whether they're giving good advice. So they do like a whole workup and a survey of the needs. And if a loan is the right product, they try to get them to take a loan. But if insurance or savings is the right product, they're incentivized to get that kind of product to them as well. So I think you could, you know, there are institutions out there that are doing this with, you know, um, very close ties between the financial institution and the household, but it's going to be less efficient in terms of scale. And you also need to trust the, um, the, the if it's a higher level of skill that would be needed in the job. Uh, and you have to be very careful about how you incentivize these workers so that they don't end up putting people in the wrong in the wrong products to improve their own conditions. Okay. Um, okay, so so there are a few other design considerations I want to talk about. So we know that there's a set of credit constrained businesses, high demand for more microcredit, marginal investments have high returns. The Bari et al. paper shows there are big benefits from channeling more resources to these businesses. But there are some other limitations as well. So one is gender. We showed last time that the within household conflicts over resource allocation actually potentially impact the profitability of women's businesses and also perhaps the impacts of loans given to women entrepreneurs. It might be that you know, if, if the household has a male-owned business and a woman-owned business, the woman goes to the microfinance meeting, she gets the cash, but when she goes back to the house, she hands it directly over to her husband and he invested in his business. So um, I think there's some interesting gender aspects there and I'll talk about one very exciting paper next. And then this question of risk-taking. So we know microfinance is very rigid. This is related to the lazy banking example of Abhijit Banerjee's um, before. The MFI and the banks just wanna get their money back. So there's a bit of a tension between the optimal amount of risk that the bank wants versus what the entrepreneur wants. Um, and impact might really be limited if there are profitable but risky investments that are passed up by borrowers. Okay, so Emma Riley, who's a professor at the University of Washington, this is, was her PhD job market paper. She asks whether the mode of microfinance disbursement by itself can lead to more female control over how the loan proceeds are spent. So she's really trying to tackle this gender issue. 
uh, and the fact that in a lot of these RCTs, you're not seeing much of an impact on women's empowerment. So the context she picks out is Uganda. And she, she shows that she it, through informal focus groups um, and qualitative interviews, she determines that there are strong sharing rules within the household for cash. So if cash comes into the household, it needs to be redistributed. However, rules are not nearly as strong in terms of redistribution for money in a bank or for a digital payment account, that individuals have much more ownership over the funds that are in those sources versus cash that comes into the household. So she does an RCT with 3,000 women microfinance borrowers, and she has three treatments. So the first is the control group. They get cash disbursement. This is the status quo. Treatment one is cash disbursement plus a mobile account. So this is just kind of a placebo. This is just to ask, is the mobile account doing anything? What she's really interested is in treatment two, when, you, when they give the, the MFI gives the initial uh, principal payment, the disbursement of the loan to the household, uh, on a mobile account. And just to make sure everybody has access to a mobile account, she also gives them a mobile account. So treatment one is just to rule out if whether, you know, in treatment two, if she finds big effects, it's not just coming from the mobile account, but it's actually coming from the disbursement, which is what she's trying to argue in her hypothesis ex ante. Okay, so this is a, the main punchline of her paper. So these are the results eight months post disbursement. Um, on profits, savings, and capital stock in the business. And she shows that, and the, so the omitted is going to be um, the status quo, cash disbursement, no mobile account. If you give a mobile account only, there are some positive point estimates, but nothing statistically significant. But what's really exciting is if you switch from cash disbursement to mobile disbursement, you have a large and significant increases in uh, profits. And this is like a, a 63, um, uh, is it shilling increase on a control mean a baseline of about 420 or a control mean end line of 395. So this is meaningful increases in profits. Now remember, they're getting the same exact loan. It's the same loan size, the same terms. This is just changing a subtlety about how the loan is dispersed. And it creates a large, large difference in the profitability uh, in, in business profitability. Um, and you can see that this is coming from the capital stock going up by about 10% um, in mobile disbursement. So this is suggesting that yes, when you give the woman borrower control over those funds, she actually gets the money into the business, allowing profits to go up. So I think this is quite exciting. These are large impacts and there's much room for improvement relative to just the status quo, quo contract. This is very cheap and easy for the microfinance institution to do. And it really does highlight that conventional microfinance isn't necessarily reaching its full possibilities, especially on the dimension of gender. I think this is a very, uh, very cool striking result. Okay, so now I'm gonna get to the risk-taking point that was brought up before. So um, there are two papers that I'm gonna talk about. The first is by Field, Pandey, Papp, and Regal. And I think this, this went to the AER. Um, and their idea is, let's just make microfinance slightly less rigid, just, just ever so slightly. Um, now, what they do is a very simple um, RCT, but it ends up being quite powerful. So in the control group, they have the status quo of weekly payments. I think this is with the same microfinance institution in West Bengal, where they did the monthly versus weekly um, interventions. And then they have a treatment group where they just give people a grace period of one month before that first payment is due. So they say, you don't have to start paying us right away. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of extra time. Um, and then I think it pushes back the, the, the rest of the, the, the loan payments. Okay, and so the idea would be, you know, the, the, the goal of this was to say, maybe we can get people to do something a little bit riskier. So instead of just stocking the same things in your, in your shop that you would normally stock, how about getting a higher markup item that might take longer to sell? Or, you know, how about trying a new product in the market that might fail or succeed um, uh, and giving yourself a little bit of, of room for experimentation before the loan officer is gonna come breathe down your neck. So this is the, this is the, the idea that they had in mind. Okay, what did they find? Uh, again, 
everybody's getting the same size loan, the same interest rate. It's just that they're getting a little bit more flexibility only on the front end. So um, they show that the weekly profits go up by a large amount, 900 rupees on a base of 1600 rupees. Um, the log of monthly household income is going up by 0.2, right? So about 20% of an increase in monthly income and their capital stocks are substantially larger. Uh, and this, and they're, they're kind of of the same order of magnitude as the uh, control mean. So these are very large effects uh, on these businesses from a quite subtle change in the contract structure. Um, sorry, before I go there, these authors have also written a longer run follow-up paper that, that I think just came out last year. Um, and they, they show that again, when you can get microfinance to turn all of these you know, positive business channels on, down the road, you see more investment in the children and the children's education. So again, that narrative does come through, but only when you are either targeting the right set of households or giving them the right kind of product that allows them to jumpstart their businesses. Okay, so that's the, that's the amazing, those two sets of results are the really strikingly positive results. The one that's not so great is this one. So these are the impacts on default. Um, so the first column is an indicator for the loan uh, not being fully repaid within eight weeks of the due date. And the, the, again, this is way more than the one month that's been um, sort of pushed back within 24 weeks of the due date, within 52 weeks of the due date. And then they look at the amount outstanding within 52 weeks of the due date. And in all specifications, there's an increase in default from allowing people to take more risk. So I guess this, this also shouldn't be surprising in a, in a, you know, a standard Econ 101 kind of model. You make a product that allows people to take more risk. They do take more risk. The um, average returns go up quite substantially, but also the variance goes up. And some people who would have been able to repay had they done the safer thing, now are defaulting. And these aren't trivial, right? They're only 4% of people um, not fully repaying within eight weeks of the due date in the control group. And that goes up by nine percentage points. So that's a 200% increase in, in default. So interestingly, the microfinance institution saw these results. They saw that the impacts were just profoundly bigger um, they also saw that default was quite a lot larger as well. And at the end of the day, they just weren't willing to tolerate the extra default and they went back to the original product and they, they, they rescinded the grace period. And they argued that, look, you know, we're, we're already charging something around 25% interest. It's basically capped already. Um, if we wanted to be able to accommodate more risk than what the standard thing that lenders do in the market is they increase the interest rate. To, to allow for that higher level of risk. In their particular context of subsidized credit in India through the priority sector, which is very hard politically to raise interest rates to accommodate more default. Um, since they couldn't raise interest rates, they really weren't, they just said this is gonna break our model and we're gonna have to go back to what we had before. So I think it's kind of an interesting, um, it, 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 it illustrates several different points about, yes, microfinance is constraining the types of investments that firms can make that's detrimental to average profits. However, it really does break the business model. And if you're in a situation where you can't raise interest rates, then it's just something that, that they can't tolerate. Okay. So I want to just say one more, talk about one more of these papers to maybe leave things on a bit of a, a better note. This is a paper, I think it's still working paper. It was, I think, r, &R at Restud uh, by Batalia Guleshi and Madistam. So they're gonna do something quite similar to the, to the Regol et al paper, um, but they're gonna make an even more flexible contract in Bangladesh than what the other authors did in India. So in their, in their model, they're not just gonna delay everything by a month. They're gonna say, no, no, no. We're gonna give you two, basically, you know, uh, two, two, two months you can skip, two get out of jail free cards for your, your, your monthly installments. And this is a monthly installment versus weekly installment paradigm. And what you see are, are similar, maybe not quite as, um, oops, not quite as precise, but still similar impacts on businesses. So people make larger business asset, fixed asset investments, their revenues go up, their costs go up, 
the profits go up, but they're not quite significant. And one of the ways that they elicit it, when they do elicit it in monthly terms, they do find some evidence that the profits are going up. Um, so this is about like a 25% increase in profits and the aggregate business index goes up by quite a lot. So we are seeing more, you know, with just these two skipped payments, these businesses are doing more, they're investing more in the business. That's great. That's similar to the previous paper, maybe not quite as strong. Um, but what's also quite exciting, so there's no evidence at all that default increased. If anything, this caused default to decrease. Why is that? Because you can use grace periods early in the cycle to take more risk. You can use grace periods later in the cycle to help smooth out shocks. And so if you know that you're doing something a little bit risky, but you can have these two months if it really doesn't pay off um, down the road, then that actually might help to mitigate default instead of expand default. So this might be a way with just a tiny bit more tweaking to, to have the best of both worlds. I think that's also pretty cool. Okay, so any questions about this? And then I'm gonna move on to um, these aggregate effects that I promised before. So please, you know, if, if anything comes up later, don't, don't hesitate to put it in the Q&A. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about next are two different ways of thinking about the aggregate impacts of microfinance. The first I'm gonna do in general equilibrium, and then the next I'm gonna to try to think about the interplay between formal and informal credit. And these are both projects that I uh, am a co-author on. Okay. So remember those seven RCT studies that I talked about uh, before. Um, there's a very nice, if you don't read anything else, there's a very nice preface to that whole issue written by, I think, um, Banerjee, Carlin, and Zinman, trying to put all of those results into context. And one thing that they write is, you've only scratched the surface of identifying spillover and general equilibrium effects. For example, non-borrowing wage earners could benefit from increased employment opportunities. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do in this project with Cynthia Cannon is to think about how access to credit especially microcredit affects the broader economy. So, you know, given everything we've talked about, it's unsurprising that there are two different channels. First, it's this narrative that the MFIs themselves love. Um, microfinance facilitates entrepreneurship and job creation, not for everybody, for a subset, but maybe over the long run and at scale, that still generates demand for employees, uh, increases in wages, et cetera. We're gonna call that the business finance channel. And then, Number two is a channel that's been much less explored in the literature. It also just allows households to bring consumption forward in time. Now, what this might do is increase demand for the products that firms are selling to these borrowers, and that can jumpstart those businesses through an aggregate demand channel. Um, and this is the kind of language that the macro finance literature has used to think about um, the financial crisis of 2008 and then the subsequent sovereign debt crisis in, in Europe. Etc. Now, microfinance is targeted again to rural villagers and micro entrepreneurs, and so I don't think the literature from the um, you know ECB area and the U.S. is particularly relevant in helping us understand the impacts on rural communities in developing countries. Okay. So, what our goal is is to measure the impacts of microcredit on labor market level outcomes, specifically wages, but then also to think about the impacts on consumption and household earnings once all of those different spillover channels have been baked in. Um, and so this is gonna be impacts on both borrowers and non-borrowers, and I think that's key, whereas the partial equilibrium studies are really trying to understand if I borrow versus not, what are the effects on me? Okay. So to do this, we need a different kind of variation. So we need market level variation in access to microcredit, and we need a quantitatively large exogenous shock to credit access. We need the shock to play out at the level of the entire labor market. Um, now, except for a few, few circumstances, there's one very nice paper by um, uh, Ted Miguel and Paul Nihas, Johannes Haushofer, Dennis Egger, and I'm sure I'm missing somebody, where they actually do randomize cash transfers at a very high level of aggregation so they can generate their own GE effects there. We're gonna use a natural experiment, which is this microfinance crisis that took place in India in 2010 uh, for variation. 
So what happened there is that um, the chief minister of the then state of Andhra Pradesh basically decided to make microfinance illegal. So everybody in that state de facto defaulted on their loans. This wiped about a billion dollars of microcredit off the map. Um, and then what we're gonna do is try to build outside of AP, this actually did have ripple effects to the entire country. And we're gonna build a diff and diff to think about comparing districts that were more exposed to Andhra Pradesh versus less. And I'll get into much more detail about how we do that in just a second. Okay, so this ordinance happened, microfinance basically became illegal in Andhra Pradesh. Um, very large fraction of borrowers in Andhra Pradesh defaulted on their loans. So we, we can think about what's going on inside of Andhra Pradesh. So first of all, there's loan forgiveness. It's implicit, they can't repay. It's actually illegal for the MFIs to go into the villages to collect repayments for a while. So there's implicit loan forgiveness there. And then there's also no future access to credit. So you have two things that are gonna counterbalance each other. On the one hand, they've gotten a positive income shock because they don't have to make those repayments. On the other hand, the path of future credit is now less certain for them. So, uh, and those might have countervailing effects. Outside of Andhra Pradesh, the effects are gonna be more straightforward and more signed. So there were no similar laws elsewhere. No other states went down um, and there was no loan forgiveness. So borrowers kept repaying. However, the lenders were really handicapped because they all of their Andhra Pradesh portfolios defaulted and their sources of financing, which were the Indian banks, decided hmm, microfinance looks pretty risky right now. We're going to go put our priority sector social finance money elsewhere. So um, the borrowers outside of Andhra Pradesh had a contraction in credit supply, but they still had to keep repaying their loans. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about the effects exactly outside of Andhra Pradesh, where there was no direct shock, where their credit supply was contracted because of the whole Indian market readjusting to this very large news. Um, and Andhra Pradesh, I should mention, is the heart of Indian microfinance. It's where Spandana and SKS, which are two of the largest players in the Indian microfinance industry, were headquartered. Some of the earliest movers um, started in Andhra Pradesh. And I think you know there were villages where people had four different lender loans from different microfinance institutions. And that was part of the, um, the discussion of why they shut this down. They were worried that the market was overheating and that people were being overtaxed and uh, were getting themselves into debt traps. Okay, so if we just look at the headlines, this is uh, an article from the Economic Times in January of 2011. Microfinance crisis, MFIs with sizable presence in Andhra Pradesh on the brink of closure. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this fact and try to run with it um, by noticing that the identity of who your lender is is going to, if in a district outside of Andhra Pradesh, is going to affect the extent to which you had to be rationed from credit after the crisis. So, for example, suppose we're in a district where the major MFI was heavily exposed to Andhra Pradesh before 2010. That, um, that meant that MFI's balance sheet got really, really hit hard. They weren't able to right away start lend, keep lending to everybody who was in the clean part of their portfolio outside of AP. The borrowers in that district are gonna get, have a big credit supply shock for a few years. However, you might be in a district where your major MFI wasn't exposed to Andhra Pradesh at all. Um, and so they were able to just keep going with their operations. Maybe you had a small dip in, in credit supply, but you didn't have to wait two years to get your next loan. So what we're going to do is compare districts with low versus high exposure to Andhra Pradesh before and after the ordinance and build a difference in different strategy. Okay, so um, I think that uh, I don't need to go through much of this, but what we have, what we, what we needed to do is we needed to understand what the lending footprints of each MFI was so that we could measure district exposure. So to do this, we partnered with the trade organization MFIN, which represents the largest for-profit MFIs, and they helped us collect this geographical footprint data from 25 different lenders for us to be able to understand um, how these you know, cross-district connections uh, look and which districts have more or less exposure to Andhra Pradesh right on the eve of the crisis in 2010. And then what we build a diff and diff out of this. 
Okay, so what, what's going on? Um, so this is basically our first stage. Um, the crisis happened in October of 2010. Most of the, uh, the MFIs report things on the fiscal calendar, which is in March. So the 2011 data is gonna be from March, 2011. So most of the loans haven't yet fully de defaulted yet. So what you're gonna see is a really big decline in credit starting on that March, 2012 reporting. Um, and then for 2012 and 2013, there's a really large decrease, sorry, in credit. And these are gonna be, um, and what we're comparing here are the high exposure versus low exposure di uh, districts. So um, the zero are going to be basically, we're, we've normalized by the low exposure districts. So relative to low exposure districts, the high exposure districts um, had a large drop per household of about 2000 rupees of, of credit. And this was actually quite an interesting episode from a regulatory perspective. And I think we learn a lot about regulation from this as well. Um, prior to this crisis, the microfinance was really regulated state by state. And so once this happened, there's this big question, well, should the RBI, the central bank, Reserve Bank of India take more ownership over the sector and regulate it like it regulates banks? And you know, across the arc of the, of the, of the crisis, the RBI ended up taking more responsibility, making this more centrally regulated um, and likely averting these types of, of crises in the future. Um, but you know, this is a hard thing for uh, a central bank to regulate. The microfinance institutions look quite different from banks. Again, as I said last time, it's hard to police the specific practices of rogue loan officers who might use intimidation to, to collect repayments. Um, and these regulatory questions are quite interesting and I think still unsettled. So we can also look at pre-trends in high versus low exposure districts by other, um, uh, other outcomes. So this one is cons durables consumption. And we see after the crisis, there is a decrease that's statistically different from zero. Similarly with average wages, we don't see much going on in the pre-period and then we see a decrease in wages. Okay, so um, this is our, our first stage. Uh, we, to be able to kind of get a sense for how big the, the impact was. Um, so the, um, with our microfinance balance sheet data, which again is only a subsample of microfinance institutions. Um, oh, first of all, sorry, let me explain what we're doing here. So every, in every regression, I'm gonna show you two different rows. Um, the first is gonna be uh, any exposed lender times post. This is our first specification, which is just the diff and diff coefficient for the places that had any lender operating in their district who had portfolio exposure to under production. This is, you know, I think 45% of districts. We can also build an exposure ratio, which is a more continuous measure of how exposed all of your the, the lenders in your district were to the under production crisis. The exposure ratio is our preferred one, but um, so each row is going to be a different regression. Uh, we're just showing you these different specifications next to each other. So we see in our district balance sheet data, a, a decrease that's very precise in highly exposed versus low exposure districts. And we also see this using administrative data that's not gonna have the sample selection problems that our other, other data does. Uh, so in both measures, we see microcredit uh, going down um, and we see uh, uh, total total loans, at least in logs, going down. And for the, so the lower wealth households, we don't see any changes at all in bank lending, consistent with the fact that banks weren't able to come fill the gap of microfinance departing because the banks aren't really interested in that, that population. Um, moving on to the actual equilibrium outcomes, the ones that we would, that we would care about where we think they would generate spillovers to other non-borrowers, we do see impacts. So in both of our measures, we see the casual daily wage decrease. So the control mean is about 150 rupees for a casual job per day during this time period. If you are in a district that had an exposed lender, that wage falls by six rupees. So this is you know, not a massive decrease, but it's still something that's, that's substantial um, that, that would affect um, uh, both borrowing and non-borrowing households. We don't see any difference uh, 
in total days worked, but we do see that there's also potentially a fall in labor demand, could also be fall in labor supply because the wage has fallen, people are working a little bit less, and because of that, overall household labor earnings earned from the labor market are falling. And that's, a, that's um, uh, more like a 10% decrease. So there are impacts on the labor markets from this, this credit contraction. Uh, and we see a noisy positive on, on involuntary unemployment. Okay. Um, moreover, consistent with the fall in earnings, uh, we see a fall in consumption, especially it's better, we have more power with the continuous exposure measure than our, our dummy. Um, there's a decrease in both durable and non-durable consumption. And if we want, if we try to do kind of a back of the envelope uh, uh, multiplier, so how much did consumption fall for every rupee of credit that was extracted from the system, we actually get a multiplier of 2.9. So this suggests that um, this is larger than, than, than multipliers in the US and, and Europe in, in the macro literature, but it's consistent with a multiplier from Kenya measured in this cash transfers paper. So that suggests that multipliers from pulling cash out of the market in lower income countries can be quite large. And these all of my, the results I'm showing you are only in rural areas. We don't see anything going on in urban areas, which is exactly what we would respect, what we would expect because microfinance is really just a drop in the bucket finance-wise um, in urban areas. Okay. Um, and then I think, you know, we, we have some other questions trying to understand a little bit more, unpack a little bit more where this is coming from. Do we have any evidence that this is coming from aggregate demand or just that business investment channel? And I think we conclude that it's coming from a bit of both. So um, we, look at impacts on agricultural and non-agriculture. Now we, there, we don't have a lot of power to distinguish, but the impacts on non-agriculture tend to be even bigger. And the non-agricultural jobs would be um, non-tradable sector. Agriculture, if you're, if you're working on wheat or rice farms, there's a you know, large global and a large national market for those different products. But if you're working for construction, you have a much smaller market. And so if the whole district is in a little bit of a credit supply fueled recession, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna hit those non-tradable sectors quite strongly. And so we find some suggestive evidence of it, but again, the, the, our, our p-values aren't, are, are, are quite large. And we see similar patterns in both of our measures. And then the last thing we can do is we can ask in using some data from the National Sample Survey where we actually have information on investment. Where is this, where is, where are, are the decreases in spending coming from, especially, uh, you know, which would likely be tied to the microfinance borrowers themselves. Um, households are reporting investing less. They're making a lot uh, smaller, a lot less, uh, fewer home improvements. Um, and this is also a common narrative of microfinance. You, you might invest in your business, but you also might invest in you know, adding a floor to your house or, or rethatching your roof. There's a lot less of this going on in exposed areas. Um, not much is going on with agricultural business, but it's pretty noisy. And we do see a smaller but precise decrease in investments in your non-agricultural business, which would typically be a non-tradable in the non-tradable sector. Um, and given that, you know, the home improvements are gonna be at the expense of firms that are, are selling you services, this could again fuel an aggregate demand kind of channel. So we think that both channels are at play, but the aggregate demand channel is actually quite important. Um, and so if microfinance is doing nothing but uh, nothing other than getting people to update their houses, buy TVs, um, buy mobile phones, that still might have these kinds of multiplier effects on the economy and they're important to understand. And so that's what we're trying to highlight here. Okay, so overall, um, you know, what have we learned about microfinance from these, from this, this large set of papers? First, RCT evidence points to modest partial equilibrium benefits to borrowers themselves on average. We, ha we have this wealth of high quality experiments from a range of settings, and we're really lucky to be able to have so much evidence to base our, our analysis on. Um, but this also masks substantial heterogeneity. There's a subset of entrepreneurs who use microfinance for meaningful, sustained business growth. 
Others use loans for consumption or starting low productivity businesses. Uh, and so that's, that's important to keep in mind. Um, but we do know that the departure of microfinance moves the rural economy and looking only at borrowers misses part of the story. So uh, these households also who are just consuming are driving part of those multiplier effects and, and taken together, this does mean that the regulator does need to pay attention because once microfinance gets to a certain level of scale, um, having crises like what happened in India can be quite disruptive to local labor markets and affect the well-being of, of households who aren't even themselves borrowers. So I think that spotlights the need for regulators to take note. And prior to this episode, I think the, the regulators had just been happy letting it be at the, um, you know, a little bit out of sight, out of mind, because they thought it was just so small that it didn't matter. I think some of the, the most exciting work is that there are many ways still that one could think about making microfinance more valuable to borrowers, graduating successful borrowers or businesses into larger loans. Um, the Bari et al. paper is a proof of concept for that, although figuring out how to scale that is going to require some work. Uh, I think with the fintech revolution that's starting, uh, we're just kind of uh, begun, there's going to be uh, better screening technologies coming down the pike, and it'll be interesting to watch that evolve. Um, and I think really focusing on the suitability to the needs of women and household dynamics is an exciting direction that Emma Riley's work just highlighted. And then again, allowing for more flexibility in that contract structure give entrepreneurs the ability to take on risk. And maybe that means moving toward more equity-like contracts, a little bit like uh, what the Bari et al. paper is doing um, is, is the way forward. But equity has a lot of issues that debt doesn't have. Um, for example, an equity contract means that the equity holder is a residual claimant to the profits once all of the other payments have been made, once you've paid your suppliers, once you've paid your debtors, um, and there are lots and lots of contracting issues like moral hazard and are they even reporting the correct profit numbers that come into play when you build equity like contracts. So I think moving in that direction is quite interesting and promising, but it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and then the need for active regulation. Okay, so I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about this last paper about the interplay between informal and formal and some risk sharing um, after that. But I'll just put this summary slide up and let people ruminate over their their questions uh, okay so given the general evidence on microfinance, how does it compare to cash grants in terms of cost effectiveness? This is a really good question. So, you know, cash grants and microfinance are quite different in that um, cash grants, you don't get the money back and microfinance, you know, you get repaid with interest and these things are profitable. So um, microfinance is completely scalable. Uh, cash grants aren't, they have to be 100% financed. Um, the one place where cash grants pay for themselves in terms of the, the I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the, the cost benefit analysis with, with cash transfers, but I think the ultra poor programs that Oriana Bandiera has studied with others, those pay for themselves just in terms of the benefits to, to beneficiaries. Um, so I think the cash grants are going to be just less cost effective than microfinance, uh, but they're going to, tar the targeting is going to be very, very different. Um, so I think that's why you know, maybe cash grants for some of the kinds of people who are, um, so, so a mix of, of targeting microfinance better to unlock better impacts, and then using cash grants for, for people who are poorer than uh, those who can, you know, benefit and afford microfinance might be the best type of option. I don't think we should think about them as being one or the other. They're I think the, 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 all of this evidence suggests that doing more screening on the loans is the way to go. And then cash transfers could be a powerful tool for, for others. Um, but I don't know of anybody who's done kind of side-by-side -side comparisons of that type of incidents. I think it's really interesting. Um, am I aware of studies that give loans to female owners, but also examine gender-based violence? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I don't 
I don't know off the top of my head on gender-based violence. I know these are, it's always very sensitive to try to ask about this. Um, I don't have any good citations. The one, the one place where uh, there's some pretty exciting evidence that I know of off the top of my head, Kelly Jones from I think American University, she has some very interesting papers on savings accounts and, and sex workers. Um, and that, but that's quite different than the intra-household questions you're asking. So I would go to some of these papers by Natalia Rigol and Rohini Panda and Simone Shainer and see if they mention that. But I don't think they really make a big point of it. Um, and so I, I, wish I, I wish I had a better answer to that. I do think it's a really interesting question. Can we get inside the household dynamics of what's going on um, with these gender control issues? I think it's a it's a, a wide open question. Uh, I know there has been some work. Pascaline Dupas has some work on um, on domestic violence uh, through the COVID pandemic, and so maybe I would check her uh, the the reference list in some of that work to see what else she's citing about this topic more broadly. But I think it's a very interesting, important question and important angle on some of these issues that we touched on. Okay. So I want to talk about one more paper. Uh, this is related to a question that came up yesterday. Um, and I'll, I'll go a little fast and I think that's fine. Um, so what, what this is, is trying to understand, you know, microfinance comes in, it has this group structure built in, but then on top of this, you know, it's not like there was no credit at all in a vacuum before. Um, it's that, uh, you know, we, we know from, Chris Udry's lecture, these villages have very active informal credit markets and um, you know, risk sharing that's going on in the background. And so when you bring in a competitor to those activities, what happens? Um, and, and so the, the, the slides I just skipped through, we're going into more detail on a paper we talked about last time by Figgin, Bergfield, and Pande. Um, so please, if you're interested, you should definitely look at those slides, but it's similar to what I talked about a little bit yesterday already. So I'm just going to jump into the general equilibrium bit. Okay. So what we're trying to do is to, in this project, is to think about the effects of an introduction of formal credit on the informal network. And then also we can learn a little bit about what network formation looks like and how people are thinking about forming these risk sharing type relationships. Okay, so this is from the, um, the India study from the AEJ Applied Issue in Microfinance. And I just, I'm throwing this up here to show you um, how small microfinance is actually compared to uh, uh, informal credit. So this is the endline one control group in urban Hyderabad. Um, now this is early in the rollout of microfinance uh, across across these urban areas. But at the time, um, about 20% of households had some sort of loan from a microfinance institution. 8% of households, this isn't a representative sample, had a loan from a bank. And 76% of households had an informal loan. So these informal loans are just really, you know, hugely more important and more prevalent than, um, than some of the formal financial institutions that we've been talking about. And so it's, there's, there's trying to understand how bringing in these new formal uh, credit tools interacts with what was there before, I do think is first order in this type of, in this type of um, thing. Okay. Um, so one question is, is microfinance improving financial inclusion? Are people gaining access to credit who would otherwise be unbent? Or is microfinance simply, sim, simply lowering the cost of credit without expanding overall credit access? Uh, and this would be the case if some of the borrowers are just saying, okay, well, I would have to pay, you know, 40% for my informal loan, now I'm paying 20%, but I'm not really doing much more with the money. And so, um, you know, this is an important question because financial inclusion policy is often enacted through preferential lending and subsidies. And if, if, if a lot of this is just crowding out what was there before, that might on one hand really explain why the impacts aren't so large. And two, it would give a very different picture of the benefits of these subsidies um, to, to formal microfinance institutions. Okay, so in this project, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at data from two different experiments to try to understand how the network changes because of microfinance. 
And this is a different kind of general equilibrium impact. This is, a, we're gonna think about the network as being all of the connections within a village that might be very important for informal lending and for sustaining risk sharing. Um, and we're trying to ask when, a, when the microfinance comes in and it, it affects the kinds of people who borrow, what happens to everybody else? So even the people who are ineligible for microfinance have no interest in microfinance. Do they also sustain changes to their social network? Do they sustain changes in the informal credit that's available to them? And do we see differences in their ability to self-insure in their local risk sharing network? And so those are the questions we're gonna to try to answer in this project. To do this, we're going to um, look at two different uh, sort of quote unquote experiments. One of them is the Hyderabad RCT, and you've seen this a couple of times already. The other is um, this project that my co-authors uh, completed um, from the diffusion of microfinance natural experiment. What they That's a paper in, in science. They have very, very detailed network data. And in that project, they show how microfinance diffuses through the network. This is gonna not be an RCT. So there's 75 villages where they have very, very detailed network data at two snapshots in time. And between the two survey rounds, microfinance entered 43 out of the 75 villages, not at random. So what we're gonna do is do a diff and diff on the places that added microfinance versus the ones that didn't. Now the Hyderabad RCT is actually an RCT, but we are the network data we're gonna have there is not as, as, as granular and we only have a cross section instead of a panel. Okay. So what are the, what's the punchline of this? So what we can do is ask in our data, we can use machine learning to predict who are the kinds of people um, who would borrow from microfinance. We're gonna label them as H's. And then we're gonna say, well, if you're not an H, you're an L. So H is high propensity microfinance borrower, L is low propensity microfinance borrower. And then we can ask what happens to your, your links. So the first row, is asking once microfinance has come, what has happened to the previously existing LL links, links between people who both didn't really have any interest in microfinance. It turns out that those links are six percentage points less likely to exist after microfinance comes. Remember, these are, on, these are, these are two households that really were not likely borrowers from microfinance. Moreover, if we look at the differential impacts for the LH links or the HH links, all of these coefficients are positive um, and some of them are actually marginally significant. And so um, what's interesting is that the LL links fall just as much, if not more, than the HH and LH links. We see similar effects for Hyderabad as well. The LL links fall um, by uh, half a percent um, which is still a large fall relative to the, to the control mean of 2.5% of, of, of those links exist that could have existed. Okay, so then I wanna show you just two more things. We see the same thing for triples of nodes, um, but I wanna move on to um, borrowing. So again, what we can ask what's happening to the people who themselves are low propensity borrowers it turns out they're losing informal credit. They have less credit they're getting from friends. They're less likely to participate in SHGs and they're not getting microfinance, much microfinance themselves. So it does seem that there's something that's going on with the informal network. And then the last thing I wanna show you is what's happening to risk sharing. So in the Hyderabad data, we can actually run a regression that looks like the Townsend regression um, from Townsend 94, which is a seminal paper on informal risk sharing in village India. So we can look at the covariance of um, your consumption with your own income. And if you're well insured, you shouldn't, your, your own income should not be very uh, predictive of your consumption that period, especially conditional on aggregate village consumption, which we get capture in a fixed effect here. So what do we find? If we look at the first column, this is your non-food consumption. So this is the discretionary portion of your consumption bundle. We see in the third row that household income is correlated um, with non-food consumption. But when microfinance comes and you're a low propensity borrower, that correlation more than doubles. So what does that mean? That means that these households who are themselves not very interested in borrowing who have also lost a bunch of their network links, who've lost informal borrowing, also now are more exposed 
to income fluctuations that show up in their consumption. So risk sharing is working less well in these villages as well. So I think that all suggests that, you know, the paper we talked about last time in partial equilibrium microfinance forges relationships among group, rate, group mates, but formal and informal finance are substitutes. So when we think about this in equilibrium, we see that informal relationships are crowded out even for the non-borrowing households. And this is an important policy externality that does need to be taken into consideration. So for one example, perhaps if you're subsidizing the entry of credit, you should maybe also subsidize the entry of formal insurance so that the non-borrowers who might be losing out from informal insurance have some options as well. Okay, thank you very much. It's been, um, it's been really great getting to share the, these microfinance lectures with you. This is some of my favorite content in all of development economics. Um, and if anybody has any follow-up questions, I'd be happy to, if you, you know, reach out an email, you can find my email address on my, on my webpage. So I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry for having to rush a bit at the end. Best of luck to everyone. Bye.